to Ridgeline Minerals Live Investment Summit today, hosted by SIX. Today, I'm joined by Chad Peters, President, CEO, and Director, as well as Mike Harp, Vice President of Exploration. Chad and Mike are going to walk us through their company presentation today. And after, we move on to a live Q&A session, where we'll be accepting and answering some questions. You can submit your questions using the Q&A panel found on the right-hand side of your screen at any time. And as always, this summit is being recorded, and it'll be available to watch afterwards on SIX.com. Without further ado, Chad, I'm going to kick things over to you to get us started. Thanks, Cam. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. We're uh, excited to be doing a quick rundown of our Robert Gulch acquisition, why we're excited. I think a few of the uh, most common questions we received in the last week has been, you know, first, why Idaho? And then followed by, okay, how does this, how does this fit into your portfolio? So I'm going to talk a bit about the strategy, why we made this acquisition, and then we're going to let Mike get into the weeds on the rocks a bit with you. So we'll get started. So... There we go, a little disclaimer. You should know by now, if you've seen a presentation from Mike and I, there'll probably be some forward-looking statements, but we'll try to keep them to a minimum. So going back to the strategy of this, this acquisition, right, our project pipeline, um, if you're familiar with the company, you know some of the key assets we've been running with since we went public include Swift, Selena, Bell Creek, and Carlin East. Now, Swift is a tier one asset, um, that project that uh, Nevada Gold Mines picked up um, from us in, a, in an exploration joint venture agreement in September of 2022. This is a $20 million earn in with us receiving a 25% carried interest on the back end if a discovery is made and they hit their milestone payments. So this is a huge asset for us, big upside. Our flagship asset being Selena. Um, we're going to be spending about $1.4 million US this year starting in the spring. That's a really exciting CRD discovery that we hope to expand with this program. And then we'll follow that up with our strategic holdings at Bell Creek and Carlin East. We're not spending any cash there as far as expiration this year. We're just holding the ground as uh, NGM advances both their REN deposit uh, maiden resource, which is directly adjacent to the Bell Creek project, only 500 meters away, and Carlin East, which is directly on trend of a world-class discovery that was paid by NGM in 2020. I think the best drill intercept was 40 meters of 32 grams um, released last year. So these are that's our existing portfolio. So how does Robert Gulch slot into that? Well, what really got us excited about Robert Gulch is this is an emerging district in Southern Idaho. <clears throat> Probably the best analog to this um, exploration play would be Liberty Gold Black Pine Deposit, which is also a Carlin type um, oxide, shallow oxide system in the exact same host rocks as Robert Gulch. Now, this is a drill ready oxide discovery, and it's very cheap for us to both acquire and to advance. So we're spending more about 1.4 million at Selena this year on expiration. That'd be about 5,500 meters of drilling. We can then follow up with about 600,000 US in expiration dollars going into the ground at Robert Gulch. Um, that'll be about 1,100 meter maiden drill program in the fall. So really our main priorities this year for expiration are Selena and Robert Gulch that we'll be advancing ourselves. We have it, our SWIFT project fully funded by NGM and Bell Creek and Carlin East, as I mentioned, very strategic holdings. We're gonna see how that continues to advance as, as NGM advances the assets directly adjacent to us. So um, just a little bit of background there. So let's get into uh, to Robert Gulch. So this is a 9.3 kilometer uh, land package, as I mentioned, Carlin type oxide open pit gold target. Um, and it is half um, it com comprised of about half BLM ground and half forest service ground. Um, just for perspective, the uh, Black Pine deposit, that is 100% forest service ground. So there is permitting risk potentially associated with any forest service. Not that you're not going to get the permits through, but it can be a little bit more time consuming, right? So what we really like about Robert Gulch is all of the known drilling and discovery at Robert Gulch is located on the BLM ground, which is has an active permit that we could go out and drill tomorrow. There's upside on the forest service, and we also have a permit submitted there which we anticipate to be approved in uh, the second half of 2022, but we can go out and start advancing this project immediately. Um, one of the first things that drew us to the project would be this huge um, soils anomaly, right? This is a little bit grayed out here, um, but just to point out, as I mentioned, location-wise, we are in the same county as the Black Pine deposit. You can see our other projects located in Nevada. And um, we're only 88 kilometers to the Northwest, same horse rocks, same general structural setting. And that's what was immediately drew us to this thing is when you look, sorry, I just got to switch slides. When you look to the uh, the soils anomaly, for example, this is a golden soils contours that Mike uh, sent, spent hours uh, working on in his basement there. Um, so he'll get into those a little bit, why we're so excited, but look at the size of this thing. From here to here, you have three and a half kilometers of strong golden soils, which shows that you have a, a large oxide gold or a large gold system right near surface. It's almost a kilometer wide as well in this direction. 
so very, very large, robust soils anomaly. And our old, the old operators of this project actually went in in 2021 and they trenched multiple intercepts of pretty impressive gold at surface. Trench one hit 52 meters of 0.26 and 48 meters of 0.26 gold at surface in one of the poorer host rocks. You move about half a kilometer over to this area here. Trench three hit 189 meters of 0.43 gold, including 45 meters at 0.88 grams per ton gold. That is significant oxide gold right at surface. Um, trench two hit 60 meters of 0.4. These are some of the things that really drew Mike and I when we first looked at this project to um, to this project because of its similarities with black pine. Black pine is actually a sea of low grade, about you know anywhere from 0.4 to 0.6 grams per ton gold with a high grade core that Liberty Gold has done an incredible job of, of making new discoveries by drilling beneath the existing system and down dip. And we see that same potential here. Yeah. And that's what I really like about this one is that not only that large soils anomaly that continues along some of the more the controlling structures, um, but more importantly, um, is we have drill intercepts that correlate with those soil, that soil grid. Um, the only thing that the property is missing at this point is an extensive geophysics array, which we will be working on this year. Um, but we don't have any geophysics. So to have yeah. good soils, good rock chips that show continuity of the system, as well as drilled intercepts that, um, um, definitely correlate with those soils at surface and those rock chips is really what's exciting for me. Um, and we have very similar structural controls to say Black Pine or Dark Star, which is another pen perm hosted um, um, project uh, that I had the pleasure of working on when I was with GSV. Um, and that was another million ounce deposit in, in, in a million plus ounce deposit in the pen perm host rocks. And so here we are in a new district, big soils anomaly, um, in classically what was a poor host, the pen perm uh, rocks, um, with a drill intercept, um, with one of the better drill intercepts, um, when you put that thing together of over 175 meters of continuous mineralization at 0.1 grams per ton. Yeah, no, for sure. And then like, that's, you know, I think that's an interesting thing. Like, you know, early stage exploration is a really difficult business, right? Get it, finding a project that has gold at surface can be, you know, the consistent gold at surface is, is tough enough. But when you can acquire a project like we did for 50,000 US and acquire a quarter million dollar database with multiple drill holes that not only show thick oxide gold intercepts with good continuity, but also correlate with the surface anomaly, which is incredibly untested at surface. I think it's a great opportunity. So like some of the historic drill highlights that Mike mentioned, you know, AC4, which is located right here. And we're going to show you some cross sections here shortly. Yeah, AC4, that hit 12 meters of 0.9 grams per ton within 57 meters of 0.34 grams per ton with that whole bottoming in 25 meters of, of uh, 0.25. So that's it. that hole was still open in the 1980s when they drilled it. They didn't keep it going long enough. And that's an obvious choice for us to come back in and drill that hole deeper and hopefully hit a, high, a thicker intercept uh, with the next drill program. And I think, uh, you know, another thing that's that's worth pointing out is, you know, when you say like, you know, why why are we excited about wide intercepts of 0.3 grams per ton, right? That's low grade, no doubt about it. But yeah. the whole point is, is with this anomaly of this scale and this size, there's only been six drill holes in this area. Yeah. Every single one of those drill holes hit gold at surface, including 18 meters of 0.17 all the way out here, sorry. Um, and, you know, Gold Lion, who drilled the program last year, they drilled four holes, every single hole hit. Uh, hole yeah. three, for example, hit 12 meters of 0.65 starting at surface. Hole four. Yes, right six meters of 1.46 grams per ton starting at surface. And that hole was TD would at six meters. They actually shut their program down in the middle of the program. Um, they had a shift in, in focus and um, to another project. And they left that hole cased and ready to go with the entire six meters from surface running over a gram per ton gold. So we know there's potential for higher grade cores to this system. And the fact that there's only six drill holes in this area that actually tested the right host rocks yeah. followed by what I think about 12 or so holes out in this area, Mike, that never even hit the right host rock. They actually drilled a shallower host rock that isn't historically a good host. So we're going to switch to a video right now. Yeah. Mike's going to walk you through that in 3D so you can kind of see what, what I'm arm waving here and, and uh, going on about. So, um, why so while, while he's switching and your guys are looking at this image, uh, please, the green hatched patterns are uh, volcanic cover, um, post mineral volcanic cover. Um, and that actually obscures the larger soils anomaly. As we move on to that forest service ground, which would have been that blue line you saw on that uh, um, uh, plan view map. That remains untested and our highest grade rock chip at surface of 6.4 grams um, is just south of that. 
um, along a continuity, the continuity of the soils grid underneath cover. And we see it bleeding out underneath this cover. So there's the possibilities for a lot of buried targets. Um, but this volcanic cover is very um, spotty across the property. If you advance the slides there, Chad. You bet. So there you see the green hatch patterns. That's really breaking up that larger soils anomaly. And then if you could pause right here uh, into the geology. There so as we start to fade into the geology here, you'll see that green correlates with um, mapped uh, 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 volcanic cover at surface, but we have all of our host units um, exposed um, across uh, the entire property, which is really nice. And so um, our, our uh, project geologist, Gabriel Aliaga, has put together this wonderful video of our, our model at depth and stitched together all of the old logs that were done, um, both historically and by um, just recently by um, Gold Lion, stitch those things together, use the original USGS map and some of the mapping done by other contractors that have been pulled in over the ages. And uh, we really came together with this full thrust model um, that seems to hold water and really makes sense of that surficial geology. And so that's what you're seeing here as we cut in. And so our long section goes like pretty, it, it's a odd cross section here, but it kind of bends across the property to show the whole um, strike length of, of the system. And you see that as we have, or as we are on our west side of our property, south and west side of the property, we have very shallow targets that we can test, like Chad said, immediately. But when you look under that post-volcanic cover, you can see that it remains untested in the Wallstrom Hollow, which is the darker blue um, before it gets into that really dark gray um, uh, unit below. It remains untested under that post-mineral cover. And what I like about that is we're still seeing 0.4 and 0.2 at what would be the contact with that Wallstrom Hollow, where we're seeing also in drilling to the north um, at the heart of that Raider zone, that, that drilled zone right there at the center. Um, that zone right there, um, they drill into that with those drills, drill holes. So we're open to the south at shallow shallow depths, which allows us to really add some, some ounces to this thing and look for high-grade intersections um, at shallow depths where we know we have some faults mapped. Um, one of the things that we will be doing this year is boots on the ground mapping, confirmation and alteration mapping to really understand the surficial expressions of this system. Right now, that is directly tied just like it is at Black Pine or at Dark Star to silicification. So these silicified bodies um, tend to carry the, the grade. Um, and we're seeing that in the drilling and in the old logs uh, that we're able to digitize and bring into uh, this model. What also is exciting is that we see as we move north, we are we have that poorly um, that poor host, and we see that same host unit or that same unit at Black Pine. This sandy unit doesn't really carry grade. Can sometimes, sometimes doesn't. It's when you get down into that Wallstrom Hollow and start to see those limestones interleaved with these um, calc silts, uh, these like um, calcareous siltstones. Um, those are what are really holding the grade at Black Pine, and we see those same rocks here. Um, and as you move, you're moving to the north and the east. Um, they are getting deeper. But what that does is bring us closer to one of those better structural intersections. And as you can see in AC1, um, in this cross section here, you're starting to see those grades up against the next unit above that poor host unit, which would be the Badger, um, the Badger formation. That is looking to be a, a decent host, at least at the contact with this calcareous sandstone of the third fork. And they never tested the Wollstrom Hollow. And that's why these holes are too shallow. Um, good geology was done on these holes. They just weren't allowed to go as deep as this target would have allowed for. Um, and I think it's worth, sorry to cut in there, Mike, but it's, it's worth mentioning, just look at the continuity of grade, right? In the yeah. known drilling, every single drill hole hits up to 80 meter intercepts of continuous grade, which show you can get black pine type thicknesses, right? You want to see, right. you know, 50 to 100 meter intercepts of continuous grade. We have narrow high grade intercepts. And like Mike mentioned, over at AC1, every single one of those drill holes has sniffs of gold in it, even though it's a horrible host. So what are we gonna find when we track that system down dip into these uh, covered targets that have had zero expiration work done on them in 30 years? And even look at like the trenches, trench one, Mike, like even, yeah. even those trenches are showing continuous low grade gold within that poor host. I'm just really excited to get down deep use what you learned at, at dark star and yeah. try to target some of these deeper targets on and oh and by the way the the known strike like you said we have over two kilometers from the left hand edge of this cross section all the way to our known discovery of grade at surface so That's if we right. can define a bulk tonnage um oxide system at surface for two plus kilometers and then start chasing it down dip 
that's how you build huge tons and really start getting into, you know, a multi-million ounce deposit. So that's what drew us to this project in the first place. So, sorry, go ahead. I, yeah, no, and this, and this cross-section really shows its similarity to what I experienced at Dark Star. So not only these solicit resistive bodies of, uh, uh, that are coming up these, these uh, faults, these strongly mineralized faults, you see an exposed core, which would have been the main Dark Star deposit, right, that was discovered, easy to find right at surface. You see that exposed low grade core. And then as we continued our drill program at Dark Star from that main uh, exposed area of low grade, that's how we targeted in on the deeper target at Dark Star, which was also suspiciously in a syncline, which we see at this property, but in a syncline along a steeply dipping fault um, that channeled that mineralization. If you could pause right there, Chad, um, and maybe back just a little bit. Can you go back a little bit? Or I can sure try. Let's see. How's that? <laughs> So when you look at this, you can really see that covered target um, and how our Wallstrom hollow unit comes closer to surface, both on our south and our west sides. And it's kind of in a weird transition, but that's really, you're seeing that, that mineralized intercept. And that mineralized intercept is not only along those thrusted faults that we can see, but at the intersection with the west-northwest. This is the same setup as Dark Star. It's where you get those blowouts in these pen perm rocks uh, at those fault intersections that you really start to see grades um, um, increase. So looking at the cross section here, um, as opposed to that longitudinal section, you really do see that continuity that Chad was talking about. You see the rock chips at surface as they relate to that, um, that zone that's been drilled. And every one of those drill holes has gold in it. Albeit lower grades, it shows that at certain contacts in certain beds, um, like we saw at Dark Star, that they can and will host higher grades. So right now we're seeing anything between one and two grams in the drilling, up to six grams in surficial sam sampling, continuous grades across all of that. And we're open to the east and that depth. And if you look at this cross section, whole RG11 off to the, the right side, um, which is a fairly good distance away, in the poor host unit is starting to show a ramp up of that gold. If you use RG uh, RC21, that gold line drilled to the west, you can see that's right what was happening before they dropped into that zone. And we think that this might be one of the better uh, structural intersections as we're moving to the east this way into those deeper cover targets where the system's preserved and capped by that characteristically terrible host. Yeah. Um, which would and be and just to, and to point out scale, right? You mentioned scale, Mike. I mean, it's 1.2 kilometers from the edge of RG2101 to RG11. Yeah. So like when we're talking scale of this system, that's why we're excited, right? To, to make a big open pit, oxide open pit, you have to be able to evidence scale. And we see that in spades here at the project. Now the question is, is, can we go in after that high grade that Mike mentioned along that contact and start expanding those intercepts into better zones? And so that's the, the, the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, uh, Gold Lion saw very similar things to what we're seeing, you know, maybe different structural understanding, but they saw very similar things and they did like the project. They had to bail out of the project for another project that they wanted, well, two other projects that they were more interested in. Um, so they just had, they changed their focus to that. I saw this and saw Dark Star right away. It felt like I was back at home. And the reason that being is the Pen Perm Rocks, that supposedly terrible host that seems to keep popping up between Dark Star, Black Pine, some of the other prospects we've looked at in the Pen Perm Host Rocks, um, they're fantastic. And they can really do um, big things like a Carlin system can, um, at least on a Pen Perm scale. So we're looking between, you know, a, a 1 million to 1.5 million ounce oxide deposit close to surface. Um, you know, maybe with some higher grade pods in there that really start to change things. But working from that known shallow um, expression into the unknown where you can have a starter pit of low grade and get down into higher grades. And that's what you see here. That's what we see here. And there's a lot of potential in that way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, some of the more historic operators, you know, that were in here even before Gold Lion, they were restricted on depths they could drill um, and nothing against them. They actually did really good geology and what they saw lines up with what we know. So pulling that data in was really, really important. Always data mining the old data and, and, and taking the facts that they had, not their interpretations all the way, but some of those facts um, and put those facts down on the map and then reinterpret with, with new knowledge. So. Yep. And you know, I'm like the about. average, I think out of the 19 holes, the average depth is 184 meters. Yeah. And um, you know, which is very shallow for modern days like today. And um, you know, when you look at like even the metallurgy that you see it at both Black Pine and North Dark Star, for whatever reason, these these pen perm deposits, they seem to to heap leach amazingly. Like they're both both uh I think Black Pine is over 80% oxide right. recovery and and I believe wasn't North Dark Star like almost 90% there? Almost 90%, yeah, <laughs> in the heart of it. And a lot of that is due to the fact that this isn't straight jasperoidal rock, this is weak to strong solidification and decalcification of these rocks. And, and, and you can really see those things as you're 
at those those metrics as you go through the deposit. When we were drilling Dark Star, we knew we were in the best when we were in the more strongly solidified. But that also restricted a lot of the the gold um, to these little crackle brecciations and on fractures and in vugs. Um, where it was totally leachable. And yeah. that's what gave it, and Black Pine has something very similar going on as well, which is why they see those recoveries from anywhere from the low 80s into the high 90 or the mid 90s on their better end as well. And yeah. the pen perm rocks just seem to, to be good like that. So, yeah. And we don't need to, so that's why, you know, why, you know, you get a half, if we can get this thing up into getting thick intercepts of half gram per ton or better grades starting at surface with what we hope will be excellent metallurgy based on the analogs that are known in the same host rocks. Um, we're talking about something, you know, you don't need to go find, uh, you know, if you go up to Northern Canada, for example, I mean, you need to drill, uh, you know, 80, 90 meters of a gram and a half per ton. If you're going to make a heap leach or a milling scenario in, in Northern Canada makes sense, right? Your capexes are massive. It's a different thing down here in Nevada and Idaho. I mean, the average grades of these deposits are much lower grade. And um, they are able to make great money at them, right? So that's where we see this opportunity at at, uh, at Robert Gulch is to grow on that. So just kind of like looking down the entire strike length of the property, you can kind of see that structural setup. And one of my more exciting targets is that covered target you see to the northeast with the highest um, soils anomaly. Um, the the soils anomaly is right at an intersection of a west northwest. Um, which you can't see on this, we simplified the structural model, but at a west-northwest, um, it splits post-volcanic cover, so we know it's there, um, and with that thrust. And so that would be the deeper buried target um, that we're really excited about, a north dark star-like analog, or the deeper portions of black pine where they really started to hit fantastic grades, um, with the surficial expression being what we see um, to the the, the, for, the the closer portion of the, of the um cross section towards us where you can see the the ac4 hole the best hole on the property yep and another thing that's really great to point out is you know when you look at the topography here look at how all the mineralization is on this shallow ridge all of the soils the mineralization there's a nice little anticline and that anticline dips all the way out and kind of curves around like a horseshoe towards the covered target it's being offset by faults the whole way and you know we're talking about a great geometry for if we continue to prove out this this oxide gold near surface you got a, a beautiful hillside that is essentially completely mineralized um, from surface down to about 80, 90 meters, right? So um, good topography for a mining scenario, um, right at surface, known discovery. I mean, we just throwing this all together, we're really excited. So we want to get out on the ground, do some more mapping, like Mike said, and then also do this CSAMT geophysics survey, which I think is hopefully going to crack this project open for us. Yeah. So. And the CSAMT was critical in the Dark Star discovery. Um, once we understood the deposit, what we were drilling, and the geology after we had mapped it, we ran the CSAMT and we could see the resistive silica bodies coming up the, the main feeder faults. And we were actually able to identify our mineralized zone beneath the strong, more strongly silicified upper unit there. That's what I'm seeing here. So on that northeast where that high soils anomaly is um, on this particular image, there are there's a large, almost uh, at least 50 meter zone or 500 meter zone, I'm sorry, uh, probably up to a kilometer of uh, barren silica, uh, uh, silica uh, probably moderate to strong silicification of these limestones sitting at surface. And that's what North Dark Star was covered by was these, these buried um, deposits underneath these strongly silicified upper units um, that were just more receptive to the silica and not so much to the gold mineralization where all the gold had dropped out before these mineral, the, the silica had propagated up uh, with the hydrothermal fluids. Yeah. So that's, uh, that is our quick, wow, we did that in 23 minutes, Mike, that's probably uh, a record for us so, so far, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's, um, you know, that's the project for us. We're really excited. Um, you know, this project is right up Mike's wheelhouse and he's just going to run with it and go find a bunch of gold for us. So um, we're really excited. So if anyone has any questions, we'd, uh, we'd love to answer them for you. Great. Thanks for the presentation, gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that, yes, we are entering the Q&A portion of today's summit. So please feel free to ask any question you like using the Q&A tab found on the right hand side of your screen. But with that, let's launch right into it. James in the audience wants to know, how many meters would you like to drill this year at Robert Gulch? What are drilling costs and are they similar to Selena? I'm sorry, I missed that. I was reading questions while you were talking, Cam. Can you please repeat? Sorry. <laughs> no worries, Chad. Uh, James just wants to know, how many meters you'd like to drill this year at Robert Gulch? Sure. What are drilling costs and are they similar to Selena? You bet. So we're going to be drilling about, the plan is we're budgeted for 1,100 meters right now, which is actually a pretty substantial kind of maiden program that'll get us five or six 
holes to kind of in the main discovery area, deepen some of the existing holes and then um, head to the south along the forest service ground. So um, costs are going to be, we're not going to drill RC, we're going to drill core and our, our strategic drilling contract is only for RC drilling. So we're probably looking at paying for these shallow holes somewhere in the 40 to $50 all in cost per foot for core drilling be uh, be about a, about the right number so okay great uh bill wants to know that besides black pine are there any other gold mining projects close to robert gulch that could be potential buyers or jv partners no there's nothing near uh near robert gulch this is kind of virgin area right now um, lots of old prospects and stuff like that but um no real active um exploration or mining that we're aware of yeah okay great jeff uh jeff says your excitement about this project is clear with such positive results and the small capital requirements for several several years, why did the previous company walk away so early? Mike and I, we kind of touched on it a little bit there, but I mean, obviously you'd have, we'd have to talk directly with the gold lion guys to get the full story, but our understanding from the brief conversations we had with them um, months ago now during due diligence was just, they had three assets. They're only a couple million market cap company with uh, the treasury was dwindling as well. So they had to kind of make hard decisions on what are we going to focus on? And their two other projects are close to, they're a, they're a bunch of BC geologists. So they understand shear hosted and vein systems very well. And so those other two projects are in Northern Idaho near the Canadian border. And they're more shear hosted vein type systems that's right up their wheelhouse. So Robert Gulch being Carlin type, they're kind of first stab at a Carlin type. They just felt their odds were better if they dropped Robert Gulch and move forward with the other assets. And, and honestly, I actually introduced the Robert Gulch guys to um, or sorry, the gold line guys to Robert Gulch through EMX two years ago. We couldn't, uh, at the time we were going public and it, we just didn't feel it was appropriate to bring on another project during an IPO. So we, we passed it on to the gold line guys, but now that we got it back, we think, uh, we jumped on it pretty quick. Great. Thanks, Chad. Uh, Bill has another follow-up question, but how does Robert Gulch compare and contrast with the projects Integra is working on in Idaho? I would say there's not really any comparison there, Mike, would you say? No, there, it's yeah. a different, different, yeah. Different deposit type, their epithermal vein system, high silver. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we're uh, black pine from everything Mike and I have done um, and we can look at, it's a really close analog to, to black pine. Um, yeah. Structurally, structurally and lithologically, a lot of the black pine yeah. stuff, um, it, it's, it talks about like normal faults, the, the listric nature of these normal faults and, and where the, the gold is, is clustered is very similar to what we see here. Yeah. Oxide and, and, um, and what is it? Very low silver too. I don't think black yeah. pine has really any silver to speak of. So that would be our closest analog um, for now. Okay. Fair enough. Jim in the audience wants to know who initially drilled Robert Gulch in the 1980s. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, bite your bike. Go ahead. Um, no, 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 you go ahead. I think AC one AC holes were Evanesco, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then uh, the other ones are... Um, Cordex, wasn't it? Cordex, thank you. Yeah. And the Cordex guys, I always love finding an old Cordex project. They had, they had a ton of success in Nevada, and you'd be amazed how many projects they looked at in Idaho as well. But um, so they did some... that. Most of the Cordex drilling was focused on the sandstones, and they didn't drill deep enough. They were, they were looking at the right things, but they didn't drill deep enough to test the host rock. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, Phil has another question. Is the company cashed up for the year given a 2 million exploration budget and corporate costs? Uh, no, we're not. Um, but we're doing all right. We got 2.3 million in the bank. So it's not like we're in any, uh, you know, we're not in a rush to go raise money, but certainly to execute both at Selena and uh, Robert Gulch, we're going to need to do a raise at some point in the first half of 2022. And uh, yeah. we hope that we can do it at uh, a better valuation than we're at right now. Okay, great. Vanessa wants to know what the longevity of this project looks like. How does this area compare geologically to sites in northern Nevada as well? Um, and finally, you know, is there a future in mining jobs with this project? Do you want to handle that one, Mike? Yeah, long run. Um, so when we made the Dark Star Discovery in 2015, um, it took the exploration till about 2017, 18. Um, to really get the hooks into everything that was going on there between um, switching to core drilling and and really starting to drill it out and understand the the deposit as a whole and move it towards um, an inferred resource. So at least on the exploration and the the, the exploration is three to five years, um, especially with how many targets are here and logical step outs from known mineralization um, into these these underexplored targets. I would say at least three years on the on the on the exploration side up to five. And then at that point, it would probably be drilled out or understood enough if it's continuing to show success 
um, maybe a couple more years after that. But if you're on the exploration side, that tends to be where you would transfer things over to a different team. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Bill also wants to know if you could review the terms of the deal for the audience. Uh, yeah, for sure. So a uh, very simple deal. It's a five-year earning agreement. Um, total expenditure, work expenditures and cash payments total 1.4 million US over that five-year period of which 1 million of the 1.4 US is deferred until year five. So essentially the first four years of the deal are $100,000 per year, both in just total in a mix of cash and work expenditures. So that gives us a lot of leeway to put the money in the ground, focus on making a discovery. And if two years in or so, you know, 18 months in, if we don't like what we see, we drop the project and move on. We're certainly not going to push a dead horse uphill, but um, if we can make a quick discovery, it's a very, very uh, cheap deal that's back end loaded. And um, yeah, we like the deal a lot. Okay, fair enough. Chad, uh, another question we've had is, you know, we all know about Nevada, but may not know as much about exploring in Idaho. What makes Idaho an attractive mining jurisdiction for Ridgeline to move into? I think, you know, when Mike and I looked at this, we wanted to get into Idaho for a long time. And, and um, just from, you know, the Carlin trend and the rocks that host the Carlin trend, they didn't stop at the Idaho border, right? They continue up same, same as you see in northern Nevada. And um, we see it as just really underexplored area. You can still stake ground, do low cost acquisitions like Robert Gulch on properties that have multi-million ounce potential. That's a much harder thing to do in Nevada right now. I mean, Mike and I have kicked the tires on too many projects, um, to be fair, in Nevada that are shallow oxide. And most of them just don't show the scale to actually grow. Um, whereas what we see in this, you know, Robert Gulch and some other projects in Idaho as well is for shallow oxide. There's serious growth potential. Black Pine's a good example of that. So is Integra. And um, you know, if you want to go after deep high grade, I still think Nevada's, you know, we got multiple projects where we can go after monster high grade deep deposits, but it's nice to offset some of that deeper risk with these shallow type of projects. And, and Idaho isn't as, as staked over, you know, it's not so landlocked with, yeah. with companies all over the place. And that's the nice part about it. Um, but any of the, the good stuff that would be left in Nevada, shallow oxide like this um, is either undiscovered yet um, and possibly Penn Perm Rocks, just saying or um, they're, they're landlocked or they're too small of a property position to make a discovery and do anything with. I see a good question from uh, <clears throat> Pat Rogers here in, this, in the Q&A here. He says, and they were part of the original discovery of the property with uh, Evan Exco. One problem, the they mentioned that one problem is the people drilling the AC series of holes was that after making that initial discovery, the additional result drilling around that really yielded very disappointing results. And, you know, that's a fair question. I would say that in the 1980s, yeah, those kind of grades would be considered very disappointing results, right? They wouldn't make the cut any day of the week. Um, from what we've seen, we like the continuity, the thickness of the intercepts, albeit low grade. And we don't think that necessarily where that drilling focused is the core of the project. Like we said, Mike, actually, his favorite target is these covered ones down at depth um, to the northeast. There's multiple structural intersections that have never had a drill hole on them. So we like that this the AC holes show evidence of system, The Robert Gulch holes support that and show some higher grades as well near surface. The next question is, can we vector in on higher grades on other targets? Oh, fair enough. Thank you. Greg in the audience wants to know what geophysical surveys are you planning on running? Uh, CSAMT initially, um, we can effectively put some good lines across that, um, and it's really good at finding, since silica is our main um, our main alteration product for this, uh, silica argillation, it's going gonna, it's gonna to see the silica and the CSAMT, that resistive body, um, as the silica plume comes up. It was very effective at um, Darkstar, um, and we're able to run that line by line. We get data daily, and so um, we can really gear that into what we need to see, or if we're not seeing anything out of that CSAMP, we can stop the stop it right then. Uh, we've also talked about magnetics for the area, not only to look for intrusive material, but to pin down certain structures, uh, tight spaced uh, magnetics. Um, uh, and we did talk about gravity, but if the CSAMP shows us some really um, positive things, um, I don't Gravity's think it's just overkill. Isn't it? yeah. yeah, at least at least not initially. Um, we understand it pretty well. Yeah, um, but the CS would really help us target the mineralized faults and help us step out of our um, known into the unknown yeah. um, and, and run that corridor. And I like one of the things we really like about this is with the work the Gold Lion did and the other historic operators, we only have to put about 75 grand worth of geophysics into this project and it's completely drill ready to go. So it's already permitted. 
very minor uh, cash commitment to get the, I think, get our targeting to a point where we're really confident with some of these deeper intersections at depth and um, good, good road to... access, good road yep. access. Um, so there's not gonna be a lot of road building. We can just do pad building. Um, so that's a positive. Yeah, absolutely. Vanessa has a follow-up question. Is mining permitting harder to get pushed in Idaho versus Nevada? It can be. Um, certainly there's there's higher. Um, I think the difference, the major difference between Idaho and Nevada is there's far more forest service ground um, that's administered in, in Idaho than in Nevada. So BLM ground, it's much easier to get um, a BLM notice of intent, which is a five acre expiration permit. That's yeah. something you can get in about 30 to 45 days. It allows you to do early stage expiration on the project. Now, Forest Service, you need to usually either do an NOI, which is difficult because you can't really put a drill program onto an existing NOI with the Forest Service. You can just do surface work, sampling, et cetera. Well, what you can do is a categorical exclusion, which takes about a year to get the permit through. But after that, you actually get far more disturbance than you would with a BLM notice. So what we have is a good mix. Um, the, the known discovery and most of the strike of this system is actually on BLM ground. We have high grade rock chips to the south, like Mike was saying, which is on Forest Service. And luckily for us, Gold Lion actually submitted the permit back in 2021, early 2021. So right. we're actually going to get approval for that categorical exclusion to go drill the Forest Service probably in the second half of the year. So um, one of those risks that we saw, which was, you know, can we get out and actually drill this thing on the Forest Service is actually already kind of mitigated by what Gold Lion did before they dropped the project. So I think it shows how much they like the project. I mean, they fully intended on drilling this thing and it just came down to dollars and they had to drop drop it. So. But but to answer the question, it's yeah, it's it's going to be more a little bit more difficult dealing with both of those permits. If we had to submit that that Forest Service permit, we might be a little bit more hamstrung. But the fact that it was already running, but it can be difficult there. But you know, they're both they're, they're government agencies. As long as you understand what you're supposed to be doing and you give them what they need, um, it usually stays fairly seamless. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. So let's fast forward a year from now uh, and in a perfect world, but what would you have hoped to have found at Robert Gulch? All right. Well, I mean, perfect world. We want to come in with this maiden drill program, show that this thing can has continue, you know, continuity and can actually grow and hit higher grade intercepts. So 18 months from now, 12 months from now, I hope we have a brand new discovery that's showing significant growth potential. Yeah. Um, at least, at least um, showing that those thicknesses, um, continued to stay mineralized and, and hopefully an increase in some of those grades, you know, nothing substantial. And, you know, we're at a 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 right now. If we could get that into the 0.5 to 0.9 range, that would be great. Um, yep. um, anything higher than that would be phenomenal. Yep. Um, but the idea here is to get our feet wet, not spend too much of our budget, get a couple holes in there, understand what we have um, and get the geophysics done and then move forward um, with our mapping and everything like that. Um, get the data we need that we're missing at the moment and put the whole picture together. But we got to get some drill holes on this thing because it is so drill ready and it is so close to surface. And we have some pretty compelling targets at the moment. Yep. Okay, wonderful. Well, gentlemen, with that, that's all really the questions and time we have for today. So I'd like to thank everyone in the audience. But of course, I'd also like to thank you, Chad and Mike, for coming on today. If you didn't get a chance to get your questions answered, if you think of one after the summit, you can find uh, Ridgeline Minerals information here on this slide that is currently up or at their website, ridgelineminerals.com. But with that, Chad, I'm going to hand things back to you for some closing comments before we truly wrap up for the day. Yeah, you bet. And thanks for having us, Cam. Um, so I'd say right now, you know, we're, we have our webpage up and going for the Robert Galt's property. I uh, just got that up and rolling this week. So um, feel free to go in there. There's all this, um, all of our maps and for more information on the project at our website at ridgelineminerals.com. You're welcome to reach out at our info at ridgelineminerals.com uh, email. And I will also put in the chat function my uh, my email as well. So yeah. you'll be able to uh, feel free to reach out, ask, ask Mike and I any questions, and we'll uh, be happy to get back to you. Yeah, all the information on the, the deal itself, all the nitty gritty on the NSRs and everything is also, um, also there. So. Wonderful. Gentlemen, well, thank you for coming on again. And with that, I hope you have a good rest of your day. Cheers. Cheers.